All right, evening everybody. Welcome to the PVC Tuesday, October 25th, 2022 meeting. And as we have been, this is a virtual meeting. So we will follow the same procedures as we have in the past. Um, tonight looks like we've got, um, we've got Ridge Hill, Emory, the Theater and Light Study, the RTU, the Center at the Heights. That's basically uh, five topics. Are we also, I thought, going to cover uh, with last night's vote to move forward on the uh, Emory? Uh, sorry, got it. Um, there was one other thing I forgot. Okay, never mind. So five main topics, and then yep. the other business, and of course, the opening um, to review the approved the minutes of the previous meeting. So with that, I will put on the table um, to approve the previous meetings minutes. And I think we have everybody that was part of that meeting here. All four of us were there. Correct. Um, yes. So I will put forward that for a motion to approve. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Erwin. Any questions, issues with the minutes? Hearing none, seeing none, we will do the roll call. Richard. Aye. George? Aye. Irwin? Aye. And the chair is aye. Okay. The first uh, main project topic is Ridge Hill demo. Do you want to take that, Hank? Uh, I've, no, I've, I've, no. I've, I've got it. Pass it on to Ken. Ken's got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we met with uh, SNR last uh, uh, Thursday. They're in the process of doing both their demo application with the town and filing for the DEP notification for the asbestos removal. Um, that is a uh, 10 day, 10 business day process from the time that the application gets uploaded. Uh, I'm, I had, did not hear back from them as to whether they in fact did it today. Um, but I, when I spoke with the gentleman yesterday, they were trying to get that in uh, today. And with the town, they have to get an inspection, a pest inspection. If it comes up clean, they're good to go. They just have to fill out the health department uh, uh, application. But if they find uh, rodent activity, then they've got a bait and trap for a minimum of 10 days. Although I don't think they'll trap much up there except for squirrels and chipmunks, but um, we'll, see, uh, we'll see what happens after they do their, uh, their inspection. So I, I anticipate- I have a funny question. Do squirrels yep. and chipmunks count it? No. They are rodents. No, 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 no. no. They have to, no, they have they to be... fall into the rodent traps. Yeah. They, they, uh, it, it, it's basically rats, George. No, I understand. That, that, they're, that they're looking for. So that's, that's what you're... We, we caught a squirrel and two chipmunks at public safety. That's, that's all. And... So they, it, they it, don't count? No, 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 no. No, they don't. So I anticipate that not next week, but the following week, hopefully they get all their clearances and uh, they will be ready to start. Um, other than that, I think that the, the contracts came in today. They're in the process of getting the town's signatures. And other than that, I think we're good to go on that. Anyone has okay. any questions? Any questions? I have one. Uh, is there... I, I know the build, building condition, at least the last time I was up there, which was probably a couple of months ago, um, is not so good. Is there anything in that building that someone, not necessarily me or you, <laughs> might consider worth keeping or saving for some it's been, future? It's been picked over by just about everybody already. Okay. So, so historical it, it, commission, all that is. Yep. done their due diligence. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, did they find anything that they wanted to keep well, as a uh, Concom had some stuff stored there. They took their stuff out. And uh, there were a few odds and ends that pick, people took, some pictures that they found. Um, but in terms of any furniture or anything like that, no, there wasn't anything of any significance that, uh, that anybody, anybody took. But you're 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 welcome to come up, George. There's some there's some, there's some lovely china in the cupboard. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I was I was wondering. Uh, you know, we have the uh, the um, 
Needham History Museum. I was wondering if, um, if uh, the curator there had had the opportunity to do that. She might be interested in some of the China that's there. I, I, just be I believe they, they were through already. And they there's were. Not, yeah, there's yeah. nothing there for, for anybody. Like I said, anything that anybody thought might be worth anything has been removed. So okay. Kath, Catherine and I took two boxes over to the History Center. Then um, the conservation uh, department came out and uh, took away some of their files that were still up there. They used to have their meetings up there. Uh, and then the theater, um, Needham uh, Theater Company came up and took a few pieces of furniture. Um, for potential use in future plays. <clears throat> and then the, the town took um, whatever uh, materials they thought they could reuse, but there wasn't much. And, um, and of course the uh, <clears throat> UEC who did all of the asbestos monitoring has been knocking holes in some of the walls just to <clears throat> check for asbestos and doing their normal investigation. So it's it's ready to come down. Good. Okay. No, I just didn't want someone to come along later and say, I never got a chance to go through that. And, uh, but, but everybody, every that everybody sounds like every, everybody did. Everybody that was anybody got a got a uh, got a notice. Excellent. So not to not to take us down the wrong tangent, but it would have been nice last night, George, if we had gotten a little recognition for the Ridge Hill being withdrawn and under. And not only that, in the, in the two and a half million hour debate, which we don't need to revisit because it still gives me a headache, is that uh, no one talked about the building and how nice it was that it's coming down, adding to that value of the property. Oh. Yeah. Well, the had moderator, to put it though, Stuart, it's since it's been withdrawn, it's not on the table, and therefore we can't talk about it. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. But, you know, but we've got to get got got to get our plug. Okay, there's no oh, voting uh, items for um, Ridge Hill. Um, we only have voting items for Emory Grover. So if yeah, any... we just we just have some some invoices and a few other things under the voting items. That's it, Stuart. Right, but that's for Emory Grover, not Ridge Hill. So I'm just yeah, saying no, there's from not, a Ridge there's Hill nothing... standpoint. We're, no, we're, they're all, it's all uh, it's all Emory Grover uh, invoices and a and a, uh, um, yeah, yeah. A, uh, so we're good. Any other questions with Ridge Hill or or uh, final comments? Have, has the contractor? I, I I suspect the contractor will want to get started and get finished as soon as possible, especially considering winter and so forth. Has he changed the schedule or? improve the schedule or is no we don't we don't have he, he can't finalize his schedule george until he gets the dep info because that drives okay. he can't do anything to you have your dep stuff you're right okay so and we, the and the demo permit from the town but hopefully well, we can push we can push that if we have to unfortunately yeah, well, that, we, that, we don't have leverage come, with dep that'll come through pretty quickly but the dep one i forgot about right yeah, and, and you the, have your hand up. I don't know if you intend to keep your hand up or. Uh, me? Sorry. No, Ken. Ken, <laughs> Ken has his oh, hand up on the. No, screen. no, I, no. I'm just. I'm, I'm leaning on it, Stuart. No, 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 no. It's it's the uh, electronic hand. No, I don't see it on my picture. Oh well. No. It's okay, not. there it is. It's off. It's off mine now. I don't. I don't know why the hand was there. Oh no. Fair enough. Don't worry about it. It's my, my panel. Um, all right. Uh, with that, let's close Ridge Hill. Let's move to Emory Grover, um, which is probably the bigger topic tonight. Um, but Ken or no, I'll, I'll get, alias Hank. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start off with that one. So everyone, I think, knows that we did get the additional funding um, at town meeting, special town meeting last night. Um, that would bring our contingency balance up to uh, about 17% of all the hard costs associated with the project. Um, so the balance is, uh, is over a little over 3 million in terms of contingency. Um, currently we have uh, with existing funding, we have a little over 600,000 of existing funding. So that's why we didn't ask for the emergency preamble 
uh, we felt that that was sufficient uh, contingency to initiate the project as long as we knew that the additional funding was forthcoming. Um, so tonight, I just wanted to um, just reaffirm, get a reaffirmation. We, we intend to send the, um, we've, we've sent already a letter of intent to award, uh, but we have not yet sent the letter of award and contract. We've had discussions with them, but I just wanted the nod again from the committee that will proceed with the award to M. O'Connor Contracting. Yeah, I mean, we I voted it last time. So I, I think that, that you've got the formality. I think the only question I would put forth to the committee is, is there any other risks or concern that we have uh, with going forward with what we have? That's- I don't, I don't think you can sign a contract with them until, since we don't have an emergency preamble, I don't think you can sign a contract right. until you, you go through the waiting period. Is that correct? Uh, no, because we have, sufficient, we have sufficient funding from the prior funding to fully award the contract. And we have sufficient funding to um, uh, extend the um, BH plus A uh, contract into the next phase of work and contract administration um, with the existing funding. And that still leaves us about $600,000 of contingency above and beyond those. So the, 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 the approval last night just added to the contingencies, what you're saying. Correct. In essence. Correct. Yep. Um, <clears throat> we, we are, as you may recall, we are also going through the process of trying to get actual bids for the elevator. Um, we've reached out to four different uh, eleva elevator companies. I believe that we'll get at least one, hopefully two bids on that. And we're um, requesting those back by November 4th. Uh, once we get those bids in hand, um, that would be then assigned to the contractor, assuming the contractor um, accepts working with that, that uh, filed subbidder. Who did the, uh, the uh, uh, public safety buildings? This and Krupp. Who did? This and Krupp, TKE. Are they, are they interested in bidding on this? They weren't originally, no. They didn't even, they didn't even uh, come in for the uh, prequel. No, it's, it's a special, the elevator that we are, we'll be looking for. And so Delta Beckwith and United are the two most likely to, um, to respond. <clears throat> and we've had discussions with both and I believe that they are putting their bids together. It's, it's more or less. Or when you have a hand up. Yeah, just. Just a clarification on not having the emergency preamble. Hank, you're saying that if someone were to object within the 20 day period, we still have sufficient funds to move forward until any objection gets resolved? I think I think so. <clears throat> because we won't be seeing any change orders until you know until they start demolition, basically. And the only the only curveball is going to be if the elevator sub bids come in double what we anticipate them being, but we would still be able to cover that. Okay. So I, I have a I'm pretty confident that we're covered. In terms of schedule, Hank, are we still on track as the school? Administration ready for move in December, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yeah, we're still we're still on that schedule, Stuart, to be moving. Uh, we may move the production group uh, earlier in December, but the main move is scheduled for that week between, for the bulk of it between Christmas and New Year's. We're actually going to start around the 21st, packing up boxes, moving that stuff over. And nothing, nothing holding up the uh, the finished work at Hillside. 
heating system. No, we've supply. got uh, we've got contingency plans in place if something were to fall apart with the uh, um, the electrical upgrade. Uh, but Barry's got that um, on on track right now. Um, so, but like I said, we have a contingency plan for that shit because most of the most of the new circuits are for AC units. So we won't need those until obviously until the spring. And and Barry, you're you're still working on the heating. Um, is the burner arrived? Yeah, yeah. The burn burn burner's in. Yeah, that's everything's been, that's... in. Everything's ready to go. We just need to button up a few more pieces and parts in the loop uh, before we can fire up the loop and uh, commission the um, the boiler. It looks really nice. It looks. <laughs> Did you see the burner, Ken? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, like it, look, it looks like Methuselah for Christ's sake. Yeah, it's pretty cool looking. Um, but it looks good. They did a really good job. And uh, we, again, we just got a, a few more things to button up on the loop and we'll be able to fire it up and commission it. Great. Any other questions before we go to invoices? Okay. With that, then we have three, four invoices. Um, and I'm going to start with a change order first, um, which is for the JJ uh, Cardosi Change order number four for $4,672.71 coming out of the general contracting budget put forth for approval. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, Erwin? What is the amount for? $4,000. One, one piece of it is for painting for the uh, the walls downstairs, the original spec never called for them to be repainted, but we had to cut them open to blow in insulation. So it's kind of tough to leave them in that kind of condition. And then the other piece was for, um, oh God, what was it? Oh, we had to make some uh, uh, adjustments in the old kindergarten room. We had to move a fire alarm, full station, had to put in some uh, access panels for the unit ventilators. So that was about sixteen hundred bucks, and the uh, painting was about three thousand of that forty seven hundred. So, thank you. Okay. Okay. With that, we'll go to the roll call. Richard, aye. George, aye. Erwin, aye. And the chair is aye. Okay. And, and Michael. And Michael, aye. And Anne, aye. aye. Thank you. Let me just get that down. Okay, great. Next invoice is for BHNA their September 2022 services for Hillside. So $9,686.25 coming out of the architecture budget. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. Any questions? Seeing none here, none coming to the roll call. Richard? Yeah. Hi, George. Hi, Erwin. Hi, Michael. Hi, Ann. Hi, Chair is I. Okay, I'm going to bundle the next two invoices together. Um, they both come out of the miscellaneous well, budget. The first one is for Hill International, September 2022 services for $21,000. $212.33. And the second of the two, Wakefield Moving and Storage, IT Move to Cafeteria for $9,740. For the total of two invoices of $30,952.33. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Richard. Any questions? Hearing none, seeing none, coming to the roll call. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Michael? Aye. Anne? Aye. And the chair is aye. Okay, that's all the invoices I have, Hank. Yep. Okay. And with that, I think we're going to, we're good on Emory Grover. So now we will shift to the theater light and sound study. Could I, and... could I ask, could I offer one comment before we change the Go subject? Ahead, um, I just wanted to comment on the fact that uh, last night's uh, um, 
meeting concerned me in a couple of ways. One was I thought it was, a, my opinion anyway, uh, it was a very poor presentation of why we needed the additional money. Um, and I, you know, George, I, I know George, we're supposed George, to- George, sorry, hold on one second. Hey, Ed Olson, any chance you can go on mute? Hey. What's the question asked? Uh, Ed, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Go ahead, George. I, I think it was a very poor presentation by the select board because it confused some people. It wasn't clear um, what we wanted this for. It wasn't clear all the other stuff that was done prior to this. And, um, and a lot of people that attend town meeting uh, aren't really familiar with the building committee. Honest to Pete, I really believe that. They, they, they're not familiar with the building committee. A lot of people are new people on the, in town meeting. They have no idea what our track record is and why we're asking for things like this. So I, if there's a way to get any feedback or in the future, if there's a way for you, for example, to present that so it's clearer to people, it would be a lot better. Uh, because I actually spent some time afterwards uh, talking to a couple of people as to what that was necessary. They thought, they thought we were asking for, uh, um, we, we had decreased the size of the building and increased the, the cost. It's well, I have to disagree, George. I, I had talked to briefly, um, I had talked briefly to Dan, saw if he's okay. And then also to, um, um, oh my God, I'm having such trouble with names. Um, you know, uh, yes, thank you, Marianne. I talked to Marianne and said, are you okay with, with, with where we are and what we present? And she said she'd written up. I, I didn't have as much of an issue with her presentation. I thought John, about three quarters, that I was squirming in my seat because I just felt that it was painting a very, you know, terrible picture of not doing uh, mismanagement, it's a terrible process, it's just, et cetera. But at the end, he did clarify, and I, and I, and I, and I'm, and thankfully did it is that this is the way pro the process works. You got design documents and you go through and we are at the proper stage to get it. But I don't disagree with you. And I think the hard part is, is that um, there's we're, not enough time not, in these things to be able to set the stage for what we're really about. Yeah, we're not, we're not one of the proponents and that's part of the problem. Um, but I think in the future, when there's a question of, 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 costs and why we're asking for this. Um, I, I think there needs to be a, a, a better explanation, uh, especially with all the new people coming into town meeting. Um, yeah. I have no idea. In fact, a couple of people turned to me after that discussion was over and said, don't they have any idea what you people do? <laughs> um, you know, we completely trust the building committee to do the right thing. And you're not asking for anything unusual here. Uh, and it just, it was like, and these people have been around for a while, uh, but it, it was just very frustrating for me. I, I thought it was a poor presentation, in my opinion. But that's, yeah. I just wanted to vent a little. Uh, I don't want to make it. What's that? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if you found the FAQ document to be uh, informative uh, for those folks who had questions after the presentation? Um, I, I think the FAQ is good, but I find 99% of the time people don't read it and they don't correct. pick it up. Yep. And it's but really, anyway. when you get up in the discussion is where it really starts to resonate. And, you know, I think that we've done, we did enough in the last town meeting that I don't think that many people changed within the town body um, but I do feel that based on the comments that we made in the May town meeting, I think there was a little bit of desire to counter some of what we professed. Um, right. So, you know, it is what it is. I, I, I think in the future, we might want to be a little more careful about, um, uh, we have to give them the right to do it because they're, they're a proponent, but maybe we ought to help prepare the words for them so that they 
don't confuse the issue more than clarify it. Right, and I think opinion. also it would be helpful, and it, it happened in Maytown meeting, is some people asked for us to speak and to clarify what it was about. And I right. think that's the other thing is that there's people that are in the audience that might help others. And just by asking a question that could be directed to us to provide a right. little bit of that background. But I, I think preparation goes pretty far. But Erwin and Michael, you both have your hand up. I'm sorry, we're not sure which one went first, but um, Erwin. Yeah, just to be real quick and follow up on what you said, Stuart, um, I thought the impression John made through most of his speech is that when the original amount was determined, all the anticipated escalation and inflation costs were factored in. And so this was totally unreasonable and a surprise to see what actually came in. And I, I don't think that's entirely accurate on what transpired from the time we did our original estimate and the time the bids came in. That's that's really the only, that was kind of the only issue I had. And I was thinking, I don't want us to be too defensive about it, but it would have been nice. I mean, I remember our reaction when the bids came in. We were thankful that it was only uh, a little correct. bit over. We were well, I almost to be I almost got up on that. I almost got up on his comment there to basically clarify that I think it's it's not correct that everything is done up front. It is an order of magnitude estimate that as we go through the process, we continue to peel the onion back and get closer and closer to accuracy. That is true estimation all the way down. And I think he did paint that picture and that's what got me squirming. And I almost put my hand up to sort of clarify that, but then I, I wanted to see what the rest was about. And I think he did qualify that a bit at the end where he said, we're at a natural point to understand. So, um, yeah. but I, I, I can't help but feel that there was a desire to counter what we said in the May and get get a vendetta almost, but that may be too unfair. But I thought he did an okay job at the end, and you know he he tries to be very reasonable. But we do, I think, as a, as a group on these more complicated projects, and I think the hard part is, is people don't appreciate the fact that it's only in the last eight to twelve months that everything is taken off. And this project started what Hank when we were talking the other day, 2019. Yep. So it's very unfair to think that everybody had perfect knowledge in 2019 that we would absolutely have in the latter part of 2022 a massive escalation of inflation. No one predicted that. Otherwise, the Fed would have already been raising rates. Anyways, so anyways, you okay, Erwin? Yeah. Okay, Michael. So uh, just just briefly, I think you're right, and I think you want in preparation make sure that the select board who are going to be the proponents on issues like this make a point to do a very brief summary of the PPPC's role, and then say you know for some detailed questions, Mr. Chandler, the chair is here, okay, and that way people know that they have that. The Finance committee, alas, you cannot control. We have dealt with we have dealt with this for years and years and years. And to your point, so I actually thought you're right. By the time he got finished, after he got all his digs in, he was fair and reasonable. Yeah. But again, you'd have to know, frankly, you'd have to follow the committee to realize that for John to stand up and say, you should do this, considering the way he usually treats our projects was actually pretty good. But right. again, to your point, George, the people who don't know, don't know. Uh, so I think that would, that would actually, that would actually be fair um, to, to try to do something like that. You also might want to see if perhaps we need something that the moderator provides to new town meeting members or the town clerk does. Maybe you need a just summary. This is what, this is what the committee is. This is what is done. This is its track record. Maybe something like that. Two pages wouldn't be a bad thing to have um, because we, we deal with this all the time. The new town like meeting members. Yeah. Yeah, you feel like you have to, you have to bring things in with this, with the format of putting out the videos plus this, you know, everyone's a little cautious about what they say in their summary reminder presentations. Yep. Uh, but I do think, you know, making sure that every time we talk about a major project, uh, the the proponents make very clear you know, what, what this committee does and its role in its history. It, it takes, you know, 10 seconds to do that. Yep. All right, I didn't want to send us down a rabbit hole, but I did want to um, uh, just express my opinion on it. I think it's all on our mind, George, so you're not alone. Good. Yep. Thanks. All right.
So with that, if I may, I'd like to turn attention to the theater light and sound study. Hank. Uh, Hank? Yes, and I'll share my screen, but I should note, uh, Ed, we have already gone through the um, Ridge Hill demolition uh, project. So I know you've had a long day and uh, you also have been participating in a um, climate action plan committee meeting this evening. So if you wanna sign off, you're welcome to. Thank you, Hank. <laughs> Good night, guys. Um, okay, Good night. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, um, and I don't see Leanne in the waiting area. Can you all see that? I'm sorry, Hank, you were looking for Leanne. Yeah, I, she's in, she was there's a Leanne Sutton in, in the attendees. Okay. That's the one. Yep. There's, four, there's four folks that are in the attendees. Let me, let me stop sharing so I can, there's Leanne here. Analysts, attendees, here we go. I'm going to promote to panelist. There we go. Okay. I'm learning. <laughs> You're doing well. You're doing well, Catherine. <laughs> I mean, I can't help it. I'm just looking at titles to the pictures. So, <laughs> um, so let me share this again. Yeah. All right. Um, so we had four submissions. I did send around emails uh, with links so you could download the various submissions. Um, one of the submittals uh, from theater design uh, was not shortlisted because they did not have a full team in their response, as was requested within the RFQ. Um, there were three firms that uh, did have teams. All three we thought were fairly strong. And we went through uh, initial evaluations. Um, and Leanne and I uh, made various reference calls, which were very helpful in the evaluation process. And then we had interviews earlier this afternoon. Um, and our number one, the ranking you can see on the score sheet has Hugh Shot in first place, uh, Studio T plus L in second, and Schuler Shook in third. And the last two are very close. Um, and so I really would like to have Anne and, and Leanne talk a little bit about the, um, the number one rank firm. And, and the selection and why we think they're the strongest. You wanna start off with that, Anne? Sure. Um, uh, Hueshot uh, was the firm that we rated the most highly. They had extremely good references. Um, and uh, among the references that we uh, checked uh, were um, architecture firms who've used this firm in the past um, a, um, a director of facilities for the Stamford, Connecticut public schools, um, and um, a uh, systems integration um, a firm for audiovisual. Um, this firm uh, specializes in public sector school um, auditorium, theatrical sound and lighting. They call it entertainment lighting. So that includes um, the theatrical lighting, um, the house lighting. Uh, it also includes uh, the, uh, the sound, everything to do with sound. Um, they had quite a number of school systems that they've worked with, um, many projects that were similar in scope. 
um, to the Needham Project. Um, and uh, we thought that they um, displayed a very good plan and process to incorporate the feedback of the many community groups that use those spaces um, in their design. Um, Leanne, I don't know if you have uh, more that you wanted to contribute to that. Sure, I think um, just for me to add on to what you already said, um, in listening to their interview, what struck me the most about this firm is that their approach seemed very collaborative and inquiry-based. Um, and he had said something about how making sure that the meetings with the stakeholder groups were organized in a progressive and productive manner, um, which really stuck out to me as, as something that I'm sure that we all wanna see. So um, just to add a little bit onto what you had already summarized, Dan. Thank you. The, um, as you know, we had initially gone out to RFQ with the architect as the lead. And that was last spring and we got no responses. Um, in, in this, we asked for the prime consultant to be the theater sound and lighting consultant. And um, while initially I was somewhat skeptical about Hugh Shot, um, clearly coming through the interview and also all those references this one individual seems to be extremely responsive, and I, I, um, and I think that the type of project that they have been focusing on, uh, at least in this area, is um, is very analogous to what we're looking for. Um, hopefully, there won't be too much scope creep beyond the uh, theater sound and lighting. Um, they do have HKT architects as the um, architectural company and uh, BALA, uh, which is actually a national uh, company for their MEP and um, structural engineering. Uh, the, that engineering company uh, does have a Boston office and the individuals listed there are registered in Massachusetts. <clears throat> as is um, HKT, William Hammer. Um, but I don't expect there to be a lot of architecture in MEP. Um, at least that hasn't been put into the budget. The reason that we wanted this team was if there was, if there were code issues that required various upgrades to some of the systems, um, that would be the responsibility of these other team members. Um, the, the other uh, two teams, um, I don't, if, if any of you did have a chance to look at the submittals, uh, did have some very familiar names, uh, Studio T plus L, um, had DRA as an architectural team, uh, who, as you recall, had, um, had done the previous design for the Newman Auditorium and also uh, done a lot of work on the high school. So they're very familiar with the town and with the projects. But I do think that this other team will bring a fresh look to the space. And my sense is that that is needed as part of this process. Uh, Schuler Schuck had also had a local team um, with what is the successor firm to Anbea, <clears throat> now called Anum. Um, and although they have had experience in Needham, they didn't have the same level of experience um, with, uh, with other projects, school projects in the town. So um, are, there, are there questions from the committee? Want to ask the subcommittee? Uh, this team is, uh, other than HKT, is mostly located in the New York City area. The all of the key designers were located in the New York City area. Um, is, do, you, do you expect that to present any kind of a problem um, in terms of? Uh, 
this project? Well, they during the interview, they committed to coming up for at least uh, half a dozen or more uh, working sessions, meetings. Um, and I think that that'll be sufficient for the for the project. And also, they pointed out, as did other teams, that having recently gone through COVID, um, everybody uh, is proficient now in Zoom calls, team calls. Um, and that can fill gaps where needed. Um, OK, so you don't expect it to be a problem? No. Okay. If, if, um, Mr. Chair. Yep. Go ahead, Ann. Um, I might add that this firm also has a fairly large international presence. So their firm seems to have um, a good system, whatever that is, of working together with uh, individuals, you know, sort of across the globe and in diverse locations. So however they sort of have managed themselves, they seem to be able to cope with distance. Do we need to vote on this, Hank? Uh, yes. And then just before that, if, when we vote, do we, how do we gonna get signatures on this sheet? Cause usually we, we get it signed or will the vote constitute the signatures? I, I think the vote can constitute the signatures. I'll have to, um, note that and um, and indicate which members were absent. Okay. From a, a user group standpoint, it's you and, and, and Leanne or just you and? Both, both of us. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, for uh, voting purposes. Yes, for voting purposes. Okay, all right. Um, so with that said, the presentation on the uh, score sheet on the theater sound and light study, I put forth the vote from what I heard that to select Hugh shot. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Richard. Any further, any questions? If no questions, we'll go to the roll call. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Ann? Aye. Leanne? Aye. And the chair is aye. Okay, great. All right, any other topics regarding the theater light sound study? Um, no, we, we intend to proceed. We'll um, award the contract and then um, set up a schedule to um, organize the first meeting and perhaps invite them up to a uh, high school show. Okay, great. So Le Leanne is our, going to be, um, has already put together a list of potential working groups. And Barry, yes, you are on one of those working groups. Um, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> and and if, if any members of the PPBC would like to be on a working group, um, please email me uh, if you feel you have a specific interest or expertise in this in this area. Great. Okay. okay. With that, we will close down this topic and we will move to the RTU replacement BM and Elliot. Um, and is that you, Hank? Is that Barry? Um, is that Ken? No, uh, Matt DeSalvo. Okay, uh, from GGD, and uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for having me. I will uh, share my screen. And... and I, I did send around um, the draft report. And uh, Matt has put together just a few slides to help summarize it. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to read through that report. Um, 
I should note that we are also sharing it with Ed Quinlan, who is volunteering to uh, assist with us on this project. Yes, and so uh, we do plan to have a, a meeting to review some of the recommendations and options, or we're, we're planning to schedule a meeting uh, next week, I believe. So we'll continue on with the, uh, the report progress, and we'll include uh, cut sheets and, and further details uh, based on our meeting next week. <clears throat> so here, if, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the buildings, at the top we have the Broadmeadow Elementary School. There are five roof-mounted air handling units. They are gas-fired and direct expansion DX electric cooling. Um, <clears throat> most of them are around 30 to 50 percent outdoor air concentration. And the same could be said for the Elliott School, which has four rooftop units. And these rooftop units are the, um, are the focus of this study. So <clears throat> these schools were both built around the same time, 2002, I believe. And so the, uh, the existing equipment has become a maintenance headache from what, I, from what I've learned and uh, costly to maintain. So we are recommending replacement along with a few other uh, energy efficiency options to go along with the replacement. And, uh, the report is studying that replacement along with the additional options. So some of our recommendations for replacement and improvement are, as you see here, um, when we when the units were installed originally on the on the roofs of the schools, energy recovery systems were not code required at that time. Um, but when we expect to be permitting this project uh, would be 2023, I believe, and um, there, uh, the, the new code will be implemented in January of 2023. And the new energy code requires that all of these units based on the existing outdoor air concentrations uh, required to have energy recovery wheels or cores, some method of exhaust air energy recovery. And what that does is it transfers energy from the exhaust air stream before it goes outside and it transfers the heat and uh, moisture when available to the supply air stream to preheat and pre-cool the supply air for uh, some free, free energy from uh, stolen from the exhaust air. So some of the results of adding energy recovery to replacement units, it's not going to be as simple as uh, you know purchasing the same model manufacturer that you have on the building, uh, the, the unit footprints get a, get a bit larger. The weight is likely going to be heavier at, at each of the units. So we need to consider uh, adapter type curbs and possible structural improvements at the rooftop units to support that additional weight. That's all going to be studied um, and then designed further uh, based on the options in the study. Um, we have a structural designer, EDG, on our team. Uh, there's an architectural designer on our team, Gale Associates, who is looking at the roof, the roof condition of the roof and uh, potential roof scope that may be required for the replacement rooftop units. Um, we anticipate being able to provide adapter curbs for most of the new replacement RTUs rooftop units, uh, which would just raise the units 18 to 36 inches above their current elevation to allow for you know, a transition from the new unit footprint to the existing roof curves. Um, <clears throat> that's gonna be determined as we get further down the line get selections for the replacement equipment based on the options and, and cost estimates and whatnot. 
Uh, but roofing, there are uh, there is the potential that the existing curb or perhaps the structure beneath will not be sufficient to support the new replacement unit, in which case we would need some roofing work to, uh, to provide a new curb for the new unit. Energy recovery saves energy, so it's, it's always uh, recommended to get reduced energy usage throughout the building and ventilation is actually uh, estimated to be about 40% of every building's energy usage is uh, heating and cooling that ventilation air. Um, <clears throat> so that would be if we are considering just a replacement in kind with gas fired furnaces and DX electric cooling. That's what we're looking at just adding energy recovery. The units get a little bit larger and heavier and we'll we'll find ways to deal with that. Another option that we were asked to look into was uh, heading more towards electrification and reducing the carbon footprint for the building. So we will be studying, or we are studying an air source heat pump replacement rooftop unit system. That would be each of the nine rooftop units would be replaced with a similar, similar looking and style unit. Uh, but the heating and cooling is generated from an air source heat pump, uh, compressors, condensers, all packaged within the unit cabinet. Um, <clears throat> limits the natural gas use for HVAC, possibly the entire building. Um, but we need to review the electrical in infrastructure because electrical loads will be increased. Uh, you know, heating with electricity instead of natural gas. Uh, does have some implications for the electrical service size, and we will be reviewing that as we move on. Um, another recommendation, you know, we're replacing the rooftop units, so it makes sense to explore the downstream systems, the ducts, the, uh, the variable air volume boxes, the air terminals, everything downstream. And uh, there are currently five of the nine units on the two school buildings serve variable air volume systems, meaning that they have uh, modulating dampers that you know slow airflow or increase airflow as needed within the ductwork. So hey, Matt, I, I we've got a question from a committee member. Do you want to finish up your stuff, or do you want to take questions? Oh no, I'll I, I'm sorry. I meant I meant to uh, say. Please interrupt me. I'll join. Okay, no problem. Okay, great. George, I see your hand up. Um, just a quick question. When you do the study with the uh, uh, heat pumps, uh, obviously the, the operating cost is going to be higher. I'm assuming you'll take that into account. And um, is, first of all, is, is, isn't that true? That is true. And that's basically due to the, you know, the cost per BTU of electricity versus natural gas. Okay, and um, the second part of that question relates to um, uh, whether or not any of the, I mean, there's a lot of money floating around for rebates or, or and this is state and federal that I'm asking about. Um, would we as a municipality be, a, eligible to apply for any of those um, uh, rebates for uh, a heat pump system. Uh, yes, and we, uh, so there are programs in place currently and it's, uh, it's honestly in flux, it's constantly in flux. Uh, we're, we're constantly in contact with Eversource and National Grid through the mass saves programs. Um, and it's hard to keep up with what they're offering. But there is, you know, anytime you're replacing a natural gas system with an all electric heat pump, they are offering incentives that I'm not sure what the actual dollar amount per ton or what, what, what you may have it. Um, I'm not sure what that is right now, but they obviously are, you'll consider that. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. No, I, I wanted to make sure that I was right in assuming that, that, um, some of these would be available through either federal or state uh, rebates because uh, sometimes municipalities get um, 
uh, left by the wayside and, and can't really apply for some of those. Yeah, so there's been recent developments that have actually uh, changed that situation. There are, um, you know, it used to be that if you were doing a full building renovation, there were more opportunities for rebates and incentives through the Mass Safe program. Now they have actual equipment based incentives. So it's, uh, you know, so many hundreds of dollars per ton per unit that you're replacing and um we're we're all leaders to that to that uh availability and we'll be we'll be researching that definitely okay i didn't i didn't want to get ahead of things but i didn't want to forget that question no so, and i did uh i thanks. will mention based on your uh question of electricity versus gas so electric heat pumps uh you could get a coefficient of performance meaning the energy that you put in divided by the energy that you get out of a system. Um, you're gonna get numbers like four or five times, um, you know, you're gonna get, you get, you're gonna put less energy in and get more energy out with a heat pump system versus natural gas are, you know, the furnaces are 80% efficient. Um, so you're going to get more bang for your buck. The, 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 the cost difference is really just based on utility rates currently. And that's expected to change with all of the federal, you know, the federal improvements and the, the state programs for promoting electric electrification. Okay. So <clears throat> to, to, to be continued. Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll add after after we get through this, I'll add some other information. Okay. So, uh, so yes, there are a number of variable air volume boxes serving five of the nine air handling unit systems. During this rooftop unit replacement would be a good time to consider adding demand ventilation control to these systems. That would be a further, further your energy, uh, energy improvements. Um, you would reduce your energy usage throughout the building again, just by using less ventilation when you don't need it. So CO2 demand control or CO2 sensors in the space when there's no occupants or few occupants, it tells the, the VAV box to close. And in that you get, you're using less, less air, less fan energy and less heating and cooling. So that's an option that we're exploring as well. <clears throat> I just wanted to touch on the roof analysis. So Gail Associates visited the buildings with us as part of the study. Um, right now, they only performed a visual inspection. Uh, we, we held off on doing any test cuts. Maybe, maybe we'll pursue those later in the, in the study project or in the design project. Um, they're based on a visual inspection. I just wanted to put this in there that they are not recommending a full roof replacement. So it's a repair you know, they have, they took some pictures and they're in the report, um, you know, just some, some weak areas throughout the roof on corners and, and under stones and things like that, but they were not recommending a full replacement. And that kind of ties into, uh, Hank had asked me to look into the MSBA roof repair program in case we wanted to pursue uh, photovoltaics, solar panels, a solar panel array um, in order to support an air source heat pump type system. You know, as you, as you mentioned, George, the, uh, the electric heat pump system will cost more and we need to recoup that somehow. So we could, we will be uh, looking at what it would take to put a PV array on the roof. Uh, there are structural, uh, the structural sections in the report do mention that there is some uh, additional structural capacity for PV arrays. And, um, but you know, we, we have some more research to do. And I just wanted to mention that the MSBA roof repair program, also known as the accelerated repair program, is not currently an option. Um, 
we were we wanted to mention this because if you're going to put PV on a roof, you want it to be semi new. Uh, you want it to be under under a, a tall warranty so that you have some years left before you have to pull them off and, and make roof repairs. Um, as I mentioned I believe, before. Oh, I believe uh, those, those roofs were all designed to be solar ready, but we didn't put solar on it, of course. But yeah, uh, yes. so there should be sufficient strength there, but we don't know. Right. I'm pretty sure there is. And we will uh, we will dig more into that with our structural engineer. So we were also asked to look into summer reheat improvements. Currently, the uh, standard efficiency boiler plants in each building, you know, they're just uh, 80%, maybe maybe 85% max efficiency. Um, those are running during the summer to provide hot water to the variable air volume box, VAV box reheats. Um, so some, some cool air is delivered from the rooftop unit through the duct systems and then a hot water coil in the VAV box reheats that that air to dehumidify and make it more comfortable for the occupants. Currently though, the way, the way that's done is through use of a big, not very efficient heating plant. And so we're looking into ways to improve that efficiency uh, to not run the, run the big heating plant. Um, and so we, we're looking to, into a few options, which is a dedica dedicated condensing high efficiency natural gas boiler, as you see in the uh, image on the left, the typical you know, typical high efficiency natural gas boiler. We would just have a, a system dedicated to serving the reheats so that we don't have to run the larger boiler plant uh, during the summer and we would save save some money that way. Um, more A more electrified option would be an air source heat pump uh, on the roof or on grid, most likely on the roof on these buildings. There's a lot of flat area up there. Um, an air source heat pump generates hot water using electricity. Again, we'll review the, uh, the electrical service sizes and uh, make sure that we can pursue this. Uh, with an air source heat pump, we get typically a maximum of 130 degrees, maybe 140 degrees from some products. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the water that's delivered to the reheats now is actually 180 degrees. So this this option would require that we we supplement the, the the hot water reheat coils that are installed now, either replacing the hot water reheat coils to be appropriately si sized for the lower temperature water, um, <clears throat> or we could add add reheat coil downstream of the existing VAVs to provide additional heat as needed. And another option for uh, summer reheat improvements and just a general improvement overall would be modernization of the central heat plant, which is uh, a much, much larger project. So right now it's a, that's an all electric, uh, all electric option with an air source or a geothermal ground source system. Um, we would replace the boiler plants, all the, you know, not all, we, sh we could probably reuse a lot of the piping mains, um, but we would remove the branch piping, all the hot water terminal units would all be need to be replaced. And that's just due to heating with lower temperature water. So I just wanted to mention that we are looking into that as well as part of our report. Next steps for the report, um, the report that you have all been uh, or you have all received is a draft. We have, uh, we have much more work to go. So we, we completed task one, investigating the existing conditions and we issued a report progress issue with proposed options. Now we're gonna meet with, with Hank and his team to go through our recommendations and see how we wanna per, per, proceed into the, the final report. 
Um, and I guess that's, that's where we're at right now. You can see, as you look down the list, we have all, all through construction of Elliott and Broadmeadow schools uh, scheduled out. Um, those things are subject to change based on how we, how we move along here with the report and the design. But as you see, construction for Elliott School, we're proposing as the first project because it has fewer units. So if we were going to replace all the rooftop units and try to get it done over a summer period, we could have Elliot serve as the guinea pig. And we've, we've, been, uh, we've been on projects and design projects that have completed much more in a summer schedule. But just to be sure, depending on the contractors we get and, and what, ha what may have you, um, <clears throat> the Elliott School would be a good, good option to go first because it has fewer rooftop units. Any issues we might run into, we could adjust those for the following summer to complete work at the Broadmeadow School. Michael, you got your hand up. Yes, Michael. Michael. Yep. Thank you. I just had to get my uh, a couple of questions on the um, as we're looking at the possibility of doing the heat pumps, heat pumps because of the significant modifications to accommodate the lower water. We also want to think about the lifetime of those systems that are there, right? because, you know, we expect this building to have to last a fairly long time. And so I think one of the questions will be, you know, you have to replace VAVs and piping and stuff, but at some point we'd have to do that anyway. We'd have to repair them. So I'd be curious how that fits in. Um, uh, curious too, did you have, do you have a rough ballpark um, in terms of if we're able to do air source heat pumps, what's the difference, you know, ballpark in sizing and weight on the roofs or wherever they would have to be, or they do they not, would they not be on the roofs? And would there be a different amount of equipment on the roofs as a result? No, I would expect that the uh, air source heat pump rooftop units, is that what, you, is that what you're asking about the, the rooftop units? Yes, so um, those would be similarly sized. They will, they will, to what's there existing now, mm. um, they will require energy recovery. So they, they'll get longer, maybe a little bit wider, just based on that requirement alone. That's with any of the options, um, but, Essentially, the, the units on the roof now have a DX electric cooling section and a heat pump section is not much different than, than what's there now. So we don't expect any of these units to grow, um, grow significantly. However, some of the roof areas, I'll go back to the first slide, some of these rooftop units are enclosed pretty closely by um, architectural features to hide the rooftop units. Uh, as you can see, there's screens, there's screens around these two units on Elliott School. So we need to be careful. Um, we're going to do our best not to need or require any modifications to those. Um, I did mention adapter curbs, which is will be our first, first attack to reuse the existing curbs. However, that will as I mentioned, raise the units up a few inches. We'll need to review that with the acoustical consultant, Ascentec. And um, that may impact, you know, it may require that the screens get taller and maybe we pursue uh, roofing scope versus supplementing this, the acoustical screens at that time. But that's a uh, bridge we'll cross later on down the road. All set, Michael. Yeah, just, just on, on that point, one of the things we are um, asking the planning board to look at um, has to do with the what's retired on roofs um, for the possibility of allowing a higher area so that you could actually put solar on top, basically mounted over rooftop units. Now, that's not there yet, but it's just something um, we've asked, and I, I think we're going to make sure the Climate Action Plan Committee asks them, the planning board, to really look hard at so that it expands the ability for places where we have a lot of rooftop units. Um, but, you know, clearly there are height, height requirements that you then, the planning board has to deal with so that that isn't a problem. Right. Yes, and I have, uh, I've heard that approach as well. Um, you know, you can build these these PV support canopies, however you like, it's just really comes down to the requirements of the, the building and height limitations. 
And they had some weight, obviously, but. Yes. Thank you. Hank, you have your name, your hand up. Uh, yes, a couple answers. Um, <clears throat> the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is still being unpacked by everybody, will have available to municipalities and nonprofits payments equal to what private um, companies or private owners would have in terms of tax breaks. So there's potential that that IRA would provide up to 30% payment for the conversion to electric. And that's significantly more than what um, is currently available coming out of, um, out of Eversource. Um, there may be some supplemental funding coming through uh, the state, but I, I do think the federal funding will be quite significant. Um, we probably wouldn't be able to access that until 2024 or 2025. Um, what, what I've heard is that there's an expiration date of 2028, so that um, we would be in that window. And um, I, I think it would help significantly, George, in terms of that transition. Um, the other point that I'd like to make about solar is the roofs generally don't have a lot of other obstructions on them. So that, um, and generally uh, it would be feasible to, to put in either on flat roofs at Elliott or slightly pitched roofs over at Broad Meadow, um, fairly significant amount of solar if this, the structure can afford it. And that would, would and could, could be looked at um, when those roofs are replaced, not with this project. George, did you have another question? Did I? Your hand, yeah, I see your hand raised, maybe, it, maybe it's by mistake. No, I don't have one at this time. Right. Obviously, we'll be discussing some of those things. Absolutely. Okay. Other comments, questions? Just looking at the uh, schedule here. Um, very good presentation. I think it's uh, very helpful. I mean, I think just to, to the solar stuff, Hank, I mean, it just seems natural to go in that way. But as you said, and I think there's two meanings to it. Can the structure afford it? One is obviously architectural strength wise, but the other bit is whether the investment is going to be there at some point. But it seems to me that the real issue is that the roof itself is not 25 years old yet. And that's the other element, which is the, M the MSBA angle. So really where we are at this point in time is all we can do is just do the basics of the units. Yes. And um, well, however, what we will look at is what the potential capacity is on the rooftop if and when solar were installed. Mm -hmm. And that would also be part of the factor in looking at um, the transformer sizes. Um, and um, so th those would be elements we would wanna build in any in infrastructure now to be able to um, allow that to happen in the future. Hank, what's the uh, what is the roof life we're expected to get from a uh, MSBA and building? Is it twenty five years from construction? Twenty five, I think. No, tw they don't even look at it for replacement until twenty five. Okay. Which is yeah. only a few years from now. That's right. Yeah, we're we're at about year twenty two right now. But yeah. still, my boss, I, I think. We, we really need to study it during this. And maybe it is possible toward the tail end of that uh, financial availability to, to put solar on there as part of the overall project, but more of an addition uh, toward the end of it, even though we hadn't considered. But we, could, we, can, we have time to look at that during the studies. I, I think there'll, there'll also be the question that will come back to the MSP and others, given the state's goals as to whether they would not prefer to have people accelerate roof replacement to get solar in. Um, because, you know, we're, we're talking, we're now 12 years from the time those buildings were finished. So, you know, by the time this is in, it's 
14, 15, yeah. you're, you're, you're starting to get there. No, yeah. we're, we're in year 20 now. Yeah, we're, we're in, in year 20. 20. God, already. 20. It was, it was, yeah, believe it or not, it was 2002 right, and right, three. Right. My son was in, that's right, my son was in kindergarten when Elliot yeah. opened it. He's 25, right, 20. So, yeah, we're, we're getting close to that window, and I, I think that would be something we would want to look at. We will also well, maybe want to chat with our friends at the MSB. I'm, I'm sure we'll look at it during, you know, in the working group. Barry, you have your hand up? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to just keep everything in perspective. Um, you know, what we have GGD doing, as far as a, a deep dive into all these options, can't imagine the town is going to have the appetite for what the prices are going to be on some of these that we're talking about. Solar, um, you know, fully electric. We're, we're, you know, the idea is to get rid of these giant beasts that are just not efficient anymore and replace them as close to in kind as possible and, and you know, kind of investigate some of the other alternatives and also kind of looking at solar and all these other things. But when we talk about moving into the building, ripping out piping and VAVs, you're talking an exponential uh, cost that people are, you know, especially with the master plan that they're looking at coming down the road with the Pollard and the Mitchell. Um, you know, my intentions when I first started this whole process of getting everybody on board and pushing this project uh, to the PVVC and then running it uh you know, through the um, the pipeline is really to replace these units because they're old, they're inefficient, um, they're still running on on R22, um, and just to to get better systems up there. Um, you know, the roof is in really good condition, the VAV boxes, the distribution system itself is in really good condition. Um, you know, replacing one of the boilers with a high efficiency boiler to offset not just the uh, reheat capacity in the summertime, but also when we don't need a second boiler to come online, even in December, and we need just a little additional capacity without these massive, this massive other boiler coming online. So there's, there's all these other things that uh, we probably really should be focused on and thinking about, but we're, we're still going to get a good amount of information from Matt and GGD. So maybe looking down in the future, we know what we're, we're going to get into when we do look at, you know, net zero. Um, but, you know, I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that, you know, the, the further we go down that road of, of, net zero the more expensive it gets um and so again the intention Absolutely. is really to get rid of these old units on the roof and put better more efficient units on the roof with some more energy efficiency some uh you know uh, waste energy recapture uh use things like that. that that's all true but from a strategic and policy po point of view this has to be looked at and we're you know we're going to do our best and i agree right exactly my yes bear in mind on solar too the general approach you will want to take, and it's, it's shifting a little from day to times, but is to look at bringing somebody in to do the PPA version, so you're not paying capital. Now these roofs are these roofs are wide open. I hope they can support solar because we could literally, if these if these units were all electric, we could support it with these these this massive uh, square footage on these roofs that have nothing on them. You can you can see them from these aerials. So uh, I hope that's the case, and we certainly should push towards that. But um, I just want to keep things in perspective for, you know, the goal here um, uh, today is. Okay. And with that, I, I agree with you. Okay, great. So with that, um, unless there's any other burning questions, um, we'll be coming back to this, what, in another month's time? Based on the yes. task list? Yeah, we, we have, they have some, some work to do. They have to look at energy analysis. Uh, we need to look at life so cycle January, costs. For two months. Well, we'll probably come back sometime in December as well. Okay, from the draft report perspective. Yeah. Okay. All right. With that, unless there again, as I said, if there's any other uh, major burning issues, I would like to bring a close to this and get to the next topic. Okay. Thank you. Um, with the last topic on the table is the Center at the Heights study. And I will turn that to Hank wins again. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, there he is. I'm, it's Catherine. I got it. I'm promoting uh, Rachel Young. Okay. Um, and Amy Archer and Rachel uh, Kalpana. Is that? Also a member of your team? No, that's a, a resident who's a volunteer at the Center of the Heights. Okay. 
All right. Um, so, so Rachel, I, I'm going to, um, sorry, hold on one second. Barry, you have your hand up. Oh, you just put down. Okay. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Then. Um, so we've had, uh, preliminary meetings with the uh, Council on Aging um, and Rachel Young with uh, BH plus A and Amy Archer with PAR um, have been doing um, studies, interviews and various other things and, and um, have looked at um, the primary issues in terms of both space utilization and parking around the um, the existing building. And so with that, Rachel, maybe I'll turn it over to you if you wanna share your screen. Yep, if you could give Rachel just one second. She said her audio is giving her trouble, so she's calling in separately. Oh dear. Um, I do have that here as well. And I can share my screen. If that's helpful. Let me enlarge this. Yeah. And while we're still waiting for Rachel, um, I believe I did send this around in advance of the meeting. And Erwin, um, hopefully you have had a chance to look at it. I did. Um, and we'll see how Rachel is doing. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to text her to see if she's able to hear us. Did you Otherwise, have any phone ask... that you had to admit? It seemed like she was going to call in from her cell in addition to her computer. Oh. Yeah, there's a phone number, 202. Yeah, 202-487, uh, 202 yep. Can you uh, elevate them? Let's see. I can't see it. Hold on. More. Yep, it's promoted. Two or two's in. Permission to talk. Can she unmute? She said she's not able to unmute herself. I don't know if someone has oh, to. Oh, I see. It's It's got a phone with a slash to it versus a microphone with a slash, but I don't know if that's yeah. a difference. Let's unmute. Yeah, Rachel, but try the other one. Try the 202 on mute. Permission to talk, rename. I see Rachel here. Yeah. Sorry for the difficulty, guys. Allow to talk. Well, Tim, you know the whole presentation. Maybe you can give it. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can give it completely from scratch, although if we want to give Rachel a few more minutes to, to resolve the technical difficulties, I can certainly start uh, some of the discussion. Um, working with Hank, um, we identified a series of stakeholders that we thought it was important for uh, Rachel to speak with to understand the usage of CAF. Uh, that included residents who use the building generally, as well as some of the specific user groups, for example, in the fitness room, uh, in the game room, uh, in the cafe, uh, as well as meeting with the staff uh, and the uh, board of the Council on Aging, as well as um, the friends group, um, the friends of the Center at the Heights. Um, the meeting 
and I'm going to get myself confused on whether it was last Thursday or the Thursday before Hank, I think it might've been the Thursday before. Um, but Rachel did present to uh, the council on aging and, and the friends of the center at the Heights, um, a, a deck that's you know, relatively similar to what she's going to present tonight. Um, I think there was a lot of interest. Um, change is always a little bit scary. And I think one of the things that we tried to relay both, you know, Hank and myself, as well as Rachel was that this is a study there's, you know, an interest and a hope that we can figure out what works really well at the center where there's areas for improvement and, you know, potentially find some, some quick wins some low hanging fruit on how we could you know, better position the building for its second decade, basically. Um, but there's always a little bit of concern, you know, what are you going to change? I like things the way they are. Um, so we did hear a sort of a mixed bag of, of comments, some people with specific comments about things they really want to see changed and other people that, you know, worry that, um, you know, just frankly, one of the things that, that some of the seniors worry about is that, you know, we're trying to, you know, convert it into a teen center or something, um, which is not what the town is doing. We're trying to make sure that the building is occupied by seniors and used by seniors as much as possible. Rachel does have her hand up. Um, yeah, I think she said she tried to log in again if you're able to promote her to panelist again. Yeah, she's out there, yep. Um, maybe try promoting, I'm sorry, try promoting the, the attendee, Rachel Young. It seems like there might be two. Um, there we go. Ice cream social. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> there she is. Ta-da, sorry about that. My apologies. Hi, to, um, good evening. I, there's been a long meeting for everyone, I'm sure, so I'll try to be brief. I think Tim did a good overview. Um, my name is Rachel Young. I am um, with Bargman Hendry and Archetype. We are the firm that originally built the CAT some 10 years ago. Um, I've been with the firm for approximately that long, but did not actually work on the CAT. So I think I'm able to kind of merge the best of birth worlds with this project. I have very intimate knowledge of the project itself, but as I like to say, I have no horse in this race. In other words, I, I take no criticism personally. Um, I try my best to be neutral and um, work with, with Tim and, and Hank and the, the CAC team to really try to do a post-occupancy analysis in essence of the building to try to best understand how it's being used today uh, post-COVID and how we can best anticipate the needs going forward. I can share my screen, Hank, if that's okay. Okay. Let me... And so I, th I think Tim had said, but just while I'm bringing up my screen with me tonight is um, Amy Archer. She's our traffic and parking uh, consultant. And as accessible parking is, and parking in general is a, a concern or an area of, of research for this project. Um, I wanted to be here tonight, have her here tonight because I think we can really dive into some of the parking issues. And if you have any questions, she's available. Give me one second as I bring up the. All right. Try that again. I. I can bring it up on my screen if that's helpful. Why don't you do that? I'm not sure what's going on with my baby. Stop sharing. I think it just has a few little edits to it, but I think we can make it this evening. And whenever you're ready. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I think there's just, I think I'd sign. Okay, there's no feedback anymore. Apologies. Um, so the the this this space uh, utilization analysis really grew out of a report from UMass in 2020 using 2019, so pre-COVID data, 
Um, and some of the key takeaways from that report, um, these are two, two just little data points that I like to keep in mind when I'm, I'm reflecting on the, the purpose or the intent of this project, if you will. Um, the CAF is obviously very important to seniors in the Needham community and that um, it, it fills a role for those that live at home or live at home by themselves, I should say. So the next slide. Um, and just to touch briefly on methodology, I just wanna reiterate that I'm a neutral in this process. I am here to listen and take in information and um, be an impartial arbiter, if you will. Um, to that extent, I like to think of myself as a practicer of reflective listening. So in other words, I, as you, as anyone in this project shares information with me, I like to restate that information, whether it be restating it literally or through the means of a diagram or plan to make sure that I understand what you are asking of me. And it's a reiterative process. And in this instance, we have multiple users, so I'm taking in multiple pieces of information. And so again, I just wanted to be clear, that's my process, that's how I approach this project. Um, the key areas that are identified in the 2020 UMass study, parking accessibility, the fitness space being undersized, um, a need for additional office space, uh, the roof deck being underutilized, the computer lab being underutilized, and the kitchen, I put an asterisk next to this, um, running parallel with this, with, with this investigation is the idea of possibly converting the kitchen to a commercial kitchen. And I know you're familiar with this project as, as it's um, running parallel with this investigation. So next slide, please. Um, so this is just to highlight those key areas in a plan, just so we're all familiar with it. You know, we're all familiar with the CAF, but just to, to focus in on those areas. The ones that are highlighted in red are those key areas of investigation. They include the game room and the fitness room, offices. Um, and then on the second floor, you have the computer lab in the upper left-hand corner. In the lower right-hand corner, or left-hand corner rather, you have uh, additional offices. In the middle of that second floor plan, you have additional offices. The offices are spread throughout the building. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you have that, that roof deck that's about 2,000 square feet. So a very sizable, um, a very sizable um, piece of the building. And then in the basement, there is the basement itself, which originally in the 2013 design was intended to be fit out space. Um, it has a very low ceiling height of just seven foot six, the undersided, undersided existing beams, though that's technically still could be used as program space. It's tight, it's not the most pleasant space, but nonetheless um, is available. Uh, next please. Um, and then some just additional comments from my initial um, visits to the CAF. Um, some additional spaces that are underutilized are closet spaces. This is where I think I contradict what the, the 2020 report said. It said that they needed additional um, uh, storage space. I actually looked in every closet in the building and I think that they're actually not used to their, their full potential. They're either empty or um, a simple organizational system might help them be that much more efficient. So I think that would be space that possibly would be available in any of the um, proposed uh, interventions going forward. Um, I also wanted to strike on, uh, hit, hit on the point of hybrid learning capabilities. <laughs> Um, I know that the technology in this building in 2013 obviously is out of date and some of that has already been replaced, but thinking um, going forward, do we want a, as a goal for every room to have hybrid capabilities so that instruction or uh, attendance can be remote, either one. Um, this slide is to talk about the kitchen and the possibility of a cafe lounge. Cafe lounges are something that we've seen become increasingly, po increasingly popular in the last 10 years. Um, traditionally, these are spaces that are associated with food. Um, food is obviously a driver for programming. Uh, makes it, everyone is drawn towards a food activity. The kitchen often is the mo is the heart, if you will, of the of a center. A cafe lounge is an extension of that. It's a room that centers around food and eating activities. Though it might be a coffee station or a grab and go sandwich bar, and it is less uh, has less of an institutional feel, if you will. It feels more like a living room space, has soft seating, couches, fireplaces, um, hence the term or hence the name cafe lounge. It's really both of those ideas brought together in one space. Those spaces are usually about a thousand square feet, which is the size of the existing fitness room. And this is all to say, as we're looking at all these investigations, the commercial kitchen, possibly moving the fitness room, do we want to think about introducing that concept of the cafe lounge at the cafe? 
This is the existing cafe now. You can see that it's a very popular space. One thing I thought was interesting in talking to the seniors was that when this, this room's floor was replaced, I think a few years ago, their, their um, small multi-purpose room and the meal programs associated with were temporarily relocated to their game room, which is about 1300 square feet in size. And uh, a lot of the feedback I heard was that they really liked that space. And that space kind of gets at the idea of a cafe lounge. Um, so I thought that was interesting that there was already some validation, if you will, among the patrons of that concept. Next. Uh, and then as we, we look, um, as we explore this idea of a commercial kitchen, I just went back to collect some historical data, some precedents of projects that we've recently completed that give you an idea of the sizes, um, the ranges and sizes for commercial kitchens in the senior center. And to note that the CAF is at the larger size. That is neither good nor bad, it's just a data point. Um, this is to say that I think that we could um, use some of the space that's in the kitchen now if we chose that as an option, um, because the, the kitchen already has, I think, enough space to support the commercial uh, purpose, if you will. Um, one other point um, to the commercial kitchen as a next step, um, I volunteered to, review, to do a peer review, if you will, of the commercial kitchen um, submission that was recently um, given, to the, given to the town um, with our kitchen consultant, um, just to review the plans, review some of the assumptions and, uh, and give our feedback. This is an image of the cafe lounge at Falmouth Senior Center, which was completed last year to give you an idea of what the feel of a space like that might be. Um, the next slide is looking in the same space, but towards the kitchen. And it shows you the connection that you could have between a commercial kitchen and a, a lounge space. This is their grab and go um, sandwich counter where they might have like wrapped up um, sandwiches or muffins, light, light, light snack food, if you will. Um, so moving on to some of the additional areas uh, that were highlighted in the 2020 report, uh, parking. So I'm really gonna go through the parking issues, I, I believe we're all familiar with them. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Amy um, and she can go into a little more depth. And Amy, I apologize, the slide you wanted is not in this presentation. Um, so the two, uh, the two issues or concerns with the current parking are um, demand and the location of accessible spaces. So this is just a, um, a plan of the, um, of the site highlighting where those accessible spaces are in yellow and then where the main entrance to the building is the orange triangle. And you can see that there's a distance that they're not close to each other. So two approaches to addressing that issue is either move an entrance closer to the accessible parking or move the accessible parking closer to the entrance. And so we looked at both ideas. Um, this first slide looks at, can we provide additional accessible parking closer to the existing entrance? And those are highlighted in, in the yellow boxes. Uh, one was to look at converting one of the drop-off areas to accessible parking. We found that not to be a preferred option because it is not as intuitive a parking space. And for a senior center, you really want the parking to be convenient, accessible, um, and logical. And this one didn't check up all of those boxes. Then the other box that's highlighted to the right is looking at the MBTA um, parking lot. And we all know that that parking lot is currently underused because of COVID. And so is it possible to enter a short-term or long-term lease with the MBTA um, those parking spots in particular are underused by commuters because they're further from the train, but would be ideal for the senior center because they are so close to our entrance. Next slide. The next slide looks at, instead of putting the, the accessible parking close to the existing entrance, can we provide a second entrance that's close to the accessible parking? So the red box indicates an opportunity for a second entrance at the rear of the uh, building. That is the... Currently, there is an entrance there to the multi-purpose room, which is quite used um, because it is so convenient to the parking. So the idea is to accept that reality and turn it into a, a true vestibule with an airlock um, and uh, my senior um, uh, touchscreen capabilities so that we can keep track of who's coming and going from the building, security camera, so that again, we know who's coming in and out, but really acknowledge it as a secondary entrance that would heavily be used. And at that same time, add additional accessible parking. Um, I think that the number that we have now, the three three accessible parking spaces definitely should be bumped up to at a minimum of six more, or I'm sorry, total six, so three more. All right, next slide. 
Um, this was another option that we looked at, which was putting that entrance, that secondary entrance, if you will, um, to the um, to the west, I believe. Forgive me if I'm getting my orientations incorrect. Um, and again, this didn't check off all the boxes of this is, is intuitive and logical for, for senior drivers. And so this was not a preferred um, option. Okay, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Amy if I'm not putting you on the spot. Nope, that's fine. Actually, I'm gonna pick up right where you left off because uh, Rachel asked us to consider from a circulation perspective within the parking lot, uh, if there was anything that we may wanna add or uh, give input on related to those three. So we didn't recommend that the drop-off area be used for parking because it's the highest level of conflict within the site. It's the primary entrance. You have everyone coming in and out of that main drive there, whether they're for the center or the MBTA. Uh, and it's just an area with a lot going on. And we don't want to eliminate the drop-off area. So if you were going to put the handicapped parking there, then you'd have to extend that bay uh, to kind of continue to allow the drop off. If it were to be in the MBTA spot, we would also recommend that you just shift it north and put it in that next kind of central area. Yep. Um, so that way you're further into the site, the people that are gonna have to cross have a more distinct point that isn't right at the main entrance and might be compounded with people entering the site and people exiting the drop off area. So that was one possibility. Um, option two was actually our favorite. We feel like it's in a spot on the site where people are relatively settled. Um, you could add an access point at that back area. It's a fairly attractive secondary entrance. Um, and we didn't see any hesitation with putting it there. The third option, while we didn't have any concern from a circulation perspective or the amount of conflict, our concern was just the and a lack of visibility and lighting on that side of the building uh, from a comfort perspective. Those are probably the individuals coming into the center that are gonna need the most time exiting their vehicle uh, and getting into the building. And there weren't any good windows on that side where a person approaching the building could see in or a person exiting the building could see out into the parking lot. So we said to Rachel that from a circulation perspective, we don't think there's anything wrong with that side, but if it was gonna be the one considered, they might wanna address some of those things with modifications to the building and the entrance. Uh, so the next thing that we looked at was the existing conditions of the parking lot. I don't think there's a slide that speaks to this, but if you wanna just leave it there for now. Uh, so what we did was we went out on one of the center's peak days, um, one of the mornings where a brunch activity was happening where a high level of participation was anticipated from the patrons. Um, so we got there early enough to see the MBTA parking prior to the center opening. We wanted to make sure we had an understanding of the distribution of parking demand related to the MBTA use and then separately the center. So upon arrival, uh, the MBTA train, the main one for the morning commute had already come through uh, and there were only 14 um, cars parked near the MBTA. And as Rachel mentioned, they were parked closest to their handicapped spaces, as close to the uh, access point to the trains as they could get. They really weren't even close to the building itself uh, in the spaces that we would likely be more interested in trying to utilize. As the day went on, the uh, senior center parking was almost complete, completely full. Uh, we saw it get to about 97% capacity and the MBTA lot area side still only had 24 spaces full. Um, so with the senior center area being nearly at capacity, we actually anticipate that a large portion of that additional 10 spaces being utilized in the MBTA area were associated with the center. Um, so we tallied up to about 65 spaces allocated to the center during that peak use with the current programming which we do understand hasn't reached the same level of patronage uh, as you guys used to get pre-COVID. And with the modifications to programming, we're hoping that things would continue to expand even further into the future. Um, so looking at future parking demand, we always work with BHA and try to do this in three lights. The first is looking at ITE, uh, the Institute for Transportation Engineers to see what they recommend based on the most equivocal use. Uh, unfortunately, they have not adopted Senior Center yet as one of their uses. 
but they do have recreational center. So we tend to use that. Um, if anything, it's a little bit conservative. It's generally a facility, a little bit more like a YMCA, um, but we've seen senior centers recently have similar demand to some of those other centers. So we looked at ITE, uh, we looked at the zoning ordinances to see what would be required locally based on the use and the square footage. Uh, and then the third use and the one that we usually rely on most prevalently is a modification from existing programming to future programming. If you currently have one large event plus two small events, and that gets you that 65 space demand, and you know in the future, you're gonna increase the um, area for the large program by 25%, say on the room, and you're gonna add a third simultaneous program, that gives us a very direct uh, correlation to look at what the future expectation would be compared to the new. Um, we are still working with the center to fully define that future programming. So we haven't been able to assess the future peak demand based on that. Um, so I'll just give you a quick summary of the other two, looking at the uh, ITE use and the zoning ordinance. So per ITE with the Recreational Community Center is the use that we're referencing. Uh, they typically look at like a, a minimal day or like a day where you're not expecting a huge demand. They call it the 33rd percentile. And then they look at what they would consider a common busy day. It may not be the busiest day of the year, but it's it's a typical peak. Um, and they call that their 85th percentile. So for the size of the proposed building with the 85th percentile, um, they are coming up with 79 to 80 parking spaces. Looking at zoning was a little bit more interesting. Um, we found that the uses within the zoning breakdown were somewhat less applicable. We either have to apply indoor athletic or exercise facility at one space per 150 square feet, which actually isn't uncommon for senior centers that we've worked on with BHA um, that are typically one space per 120 to one space per 200 square feet. So this use, although the type of use doesn't seem quite as equivalent uh, does fall within the general or generic that we see for senior centers. It has that one space per 150 square feet plus one space for every three employees. So we did work with the center, um, had a future projected staff peak of 26, which gives us just over eight spaces. Uh, and then if we add in the square footage of the center, we exclusive of the multi-purpose room. If we look at just the center, not including the multi-purpose room plus the staff, uh, we were at 66 on a day in day out basis. Um, for multi-purpose room, we were trying to apply instead the uh, ordinance for theater or auditorium, which actually requires one parking space per three seats. Um, the layout didn't necessarily show seats, but did acknowledge a maximum capacity of patrons at 245. So at 245 um, individuals being able to fit in that multi-purpose room, if we did one parking space per three individuals, that's 82. So if we look at the two together, you're looking at nearly 150 spaces, but we know the programming can't handle that. Like you would never have every single programming room active and full and have a giant event in the multi-purpose room that was also full. So we think realistically, you could look at one of the two um, and then go from there. So that if we looked at the multi-purpose room being completely full uh, with patrons and staff at the maximum capacity, that would be 82 parking spaces, which was nearly equivalent to what IT came up with. Um, so like I said, we do ultimately want to run the third projection that looks at future programming as an inflation of existing programming. Um, but right now we're ballparking about 80 to 82 spaces, which is about a 25% inflation over what we saw the day we were out there um, doing observations of the peak brunch activity. So one of the things we've discussed is, do we approach MBTA directly immediately? 
and ask them if they can confirm whether or not they expect their demand to go back to what it used to be, or are they acknowledging and accepting that this is kind of their new normal, that many people are still working remote, uh, that on a day-to-day -day basis, they just don't have the same transit demand that they used to have. And if they're okay with that, they may be willing to give up their spaces. Otherwise, it would be likely that you'd have to re-enter a lease agreement or a buyout agreement with them. Um, and so Rachel and I thought it might be a good starting place to just do a test run where you start with the staff at least and tell them on any day that they have to overflow into the MBTA space, pay for it and get reimbursed. And then you could start to tally data of how many overflow spaces you're really utilizing. So if you have to go to the MBTA for an agreement, you have a good sense of the number that you really need um, based on that new programming once it's established. So that, that's an overview of everything we've assessed and kind of the different pieces we've looked at. I can certainly answer any questions anyone has relative to the, the parking and the peak demand. Given the timing, I think we want to move along. Um, I, I will say that I have spoken with town manager. The town does apparently own the entire site um, and MBTA has an agreement to utilize that other half. Um, so we'll be initiating that, town manager will be initiating that discussion. Um, what I had suggested initially was those dozen or so parking spaces that are over by Highland as a first look-see um, with the possibility of having some of those uh, be handicapped, or maybe if MBTA doesn't need this row, you know, maybe it'd be that whole zone in there, which would be furthest from the track. Um, but I think that shared use is probably the best approach right now. So unless there are other questions, Rachel, um, we are getting late. Maybe you could move along. Yes, I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, so fitness room, it was addressed or noted that the fitness room is currently undersized. Uh, it's a very popular program. Um, we're looking at expanding it by either extending into the kitchen area or swapping the fitness room and the um, game room. Uh, we did look also at putting it in the basement. I noted that that's technically possible, but that, that option was, um, was the least preferred. So in terms of next steps, we will price out all of these options just to do our due diligence, but noting that the basement option is, is not, not going to be the way forward. Um, so this option looks at moving the game room to where that fitness room was and what you could do with the previous game room, but this would only be an option if we moved into the basement. Right, next slide. Um, this looks at sw swapping the game room in the fitness room, um, which seems to be the most preferred option, but again, costs will, um, we will do a thorough analysis of pros and cons for all of these options, cost being one of them, so we can make an informed decision. All right, next slide. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, keep on going. Offices. Um, so it, it was noted that, especially concerning, go ahead. If, if you, I, I'm fine taking a question if you want to go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. You had, yeah. You had mentioned uh, earlier about the basement space. Is it possible to think about switching the fitness room with the game room and putting the game room in the basement space? That is also possible, um, though in talking with the seniors, they did not love that idea. I, I think it, it's gonna be a hard sell, if you will, to do something in the basement just because there's no windows and the yeah. ceiling is so low. Um, it's unfortunate because technically it, it was designed to be used as an additional program space as a future fit out space. Um, but it just does not seem to be uh, a preferred option. Nonetheless, we will price it out so that everyone knows what the cost associated with that would be, um, because I think that's important just to understand it. Um, concerning and, office, yeah, go ahead. And uh, there are no bathrooms down there, yeah, which is uh, another constraint. Um, concerning offices, um, it seems that especially for the um, the social workers, there's not enough space. Uh, the social workers are using a program room for an auxiliary office. Uh, 
So we looked at a few options, creating shared open offices. They're more efficient than individual offices for programming staff, and then creating a series of smaller um, offices for the social service staff on the second floor. In terms of next steps, I need to sit with, um, with Latanya and go through this with her um, to have her, her offer her opinion on it. Um, but these are just two options looking at the second floor, providing additional offices for the social workers. Um, the roof deck, we looked at a few options for the roof deck. We looked at um, building out half of the roof deck and converting that into a 1400 square foot fitness room. Um, that would create a very small uh, deck. And um, it's not structurally infeasible to do this work, though I think that there would be a fair amount of structural work to do it. Uh, the structure of the multi-purpose room below was not designed to easily accept or it's not designed for additional fit out of the roof deck. Um, so the first option was looking at, at, at doing that fit out. The second option was looking at reprogramming or rezoning the roof deck, creating smaller spaces, a lounge space, a um, planting area, a uh, a, a large open area for outdoor activities or meals, uh, basically subdividing a 2,000 square foot space, which right now is a little overwhelming into smaller spaces so that it feels more welcoming to patrons. At the same time, we would provide some, toward, so, some sort of shade structure, be it a trellis or an awning, um, because we realize that the, the sun is harsh. This is a prime south, southern exposed site. So this, this first option looks at grouping it into a shaded lounge area in red, a small group lounge area in blue, and then a garden area around the perimeter. The garden area can double as a visual screen, and I'm currently looking at our options for an acoustic screen um, as well. The second option, and these are just some images of that screening and the type of furniture that we might introduce. Trellises and zoning. And then the next image is just a, a, another lounge area with a, with a simple trellis structure. Um, you can go ahead to the next image. Um, this next option, if you want to go to the next slide, um, again, looked at creating zones, a garden area in the center that subdivides the space into a multi-purpose area, um, tables and chairs that can be pushed aside if you wanted to have an outdoor activity like yoga, and then a lounge area focused around an outdoor fireplace, perhaps um, with soft seating, places where you can have smaller conversations. It's not a large group. And these are just some images of ways we can subdivide the space. We can even look at changing up the flooring. This is a project we did where um, we used a, um, a synthetic turf, but um, basically breaking up the space into multiple smaller spaces, I think will go a long way in making that space more inviting. Okay, we can keep on going down to the third option. The third option looked at, um, providing a lean-to greenhouse, a prefabricated greenhouse. We've done this in other projects before. Um, a lean-to greenhouse that would create a three-season room. It could be used for people to hang out as well as planting throughout the year. And then again, those smaller zone spaces I talked to in the previous schemes, so a one shaded space that would have a multi-purpose um, program to it, and then a smaller area for, for smaller lounge groupings. And this is just an image of a way that we can create those smaller cabana-like spaces that I think the seniors might appreciate where they can come up by themselves or with a few people and not feel overwhelmed by you know, the agoraphobia, if you will, of, of that roof deck. This is one, one potential shade mechanism. It's an awning. Um, there are limitations to all of these. This one covers the smallest amount of area. And then this is an image of a prefabricated greenhouse that we did at the Randolph Intergenerational uh, Community Center. This is just a quick little axon looking at developments, further advancements, if you will, looking at the, the fitness room fit out at the roof deck, and then the small vestibule at the rear that would um, go along with the additional accessible parking. And so the, um, again, that fitness addition would be 1,450 square feet, but the roof deck would be dramatically reduced. The roof deck would basically almost be like a little courtyard between the existing library space and this new fitness room. 
We also looked at um, similar to providing additional furnishings at the roof deck. Can we take that same concept or same approach to the front of the building where we have available outdoor um, unprogrammed landscape, if you will? So does this mean extending the porch to provide more areas for seating? Or does it mean extending or providing shade on the, the south of the building where the bike racks are currently? Um, a permanent trellis or an awning um, and additional uh, outdoor seating just to animate the space. Uh, basically, you're creating an extension of the lobby, a place where people can wait, uh, have their coffee on a nice day, um, really start to, to reclaim, if you will, or own the exterior of the building. And then one last thought or option is we do have a long linear area of lawn in front of the building that might accommodate a bocce core or um, other outdoor amenity. And um, that's again, not a, not a difficult or uh, what they would call short money. It, it's, it's not, um, that's a relatively easy um, improvement to make. So next steps, um, we have in fact met with seniors in person. We still need to schedule an in Zoom session. I, I would like that to be more of a formal presentation um, after getting your feedback. Um, following up with the MBTA, uh, I have raw data from my senior center as well as the transportation director that needs to get uh, analyzed and digested. Um, reviewing programming with the program um, program director at the senior center to understand what spaces are used throughout the day uh, that I plan on doing this week. Um, vetting acoustic options with the um, acoustician for the roof deck. And um, for all of these options, having them um, priced out, if you will, with our cost estimator. Excellent. Thank you, Barry, you have a question? Yeah, uh, for Rachel, Rachel, I, I didn't see the sun sails in there as an option. I mean, I see a lot of permanent structures that are very expensive. I see things that will be out there 24-7, 365. Um, and we talked about the uh, doing the uh, the sun sail shade system. Um, that would be obviously a lower cost than a lot of those permanent uh, build outs. Um, is that not going to be added to uh, some of these that are most likely never going to see the light of day for consideration? So I can certainly look at sun shades. Sun shades. I think the um, the downside of, of that approach is that they're not um, retractable, if you will. You, they they can't be operated by a user to to bring them in or out. They're permanent um, until we pull them out at the end of the season. Yeah. During the summertime, nobody's going to want to retract any of these in in the middle of July and August. Um, it's excruciating. It's hot. It's also damaging the deck. And it's costing a lot of money to continue to maintain um, this uh, type of deck. So um, I wouldn't wouldn't be concerned with retracting these sun uh, shades in the middle of the summer because I don't think anybody's really going to want um, that type of intense sun uh, out there to enjoy that deck. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to reinsert them, if you will. The other downside I saw, but again, there are pros and cons to all of these options, was that in order to have a, a sun shade, uh, sun sail, you need a um, a post at some point mm -hmm. to to pick up the other side, and so at yes. that point, if you're saying I'm going to have to put a post on that roof, it's not that far of an extension, if you will, to put four posts on and have something that's more permanent. So, but again, there are pros and cons to all of these options, and I'm happy to to reinvestigate it. Okay, will, yeah, um, I just want to add that to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. Erwin? Uh, first, thank you, Rachel, for that presentation. I was curious uh, <clears throat> from feedback you got from the staff and the users, what was the main concern that you heard? Was there any one concern about the building that stood out from others, or was it just a variety of things and uh, nothing that jumped out as a, a major concern? Um, I, I, I think that more the latter. I think if there was any takeaways, it was, um, interestingly enough, concerns with HVAC. And I think that is a, um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to reach out to our, our engineer who worked on the project and just review this, but I know I've talked with Barry and Hank about it. And I think that the system is working the way it's supposed to. 
Um, I think that one of their concerns was the heating and cooling in the small multi-purpose room. But it's important to note that's the room with the door that they use all the time as their informal means in and out of the building. And that door and room was never designed to be used like that. So I think introducing a vestibule that acts, acts as a um, <coughs> parallel, if you will, will also contribute to um, better HVAC, if you will, in that room. Uh, interestingly enough, we, we talked about moving space to the basement. Most people didn't like that. I'm trying to think of other key takeaways. Uh, there wasn't strong opposition to switching out the fitness room and the pool room. Um, I, I was surprised by that. And I think that the ideas for the roof deck, I think were all fairly uh, well received. So, Thank you. Erwin, I'm sorry if you button in, Rachel, and this brings up a really good point, and I want to keep people to you know to understand that these are these are these are electrical heat pumps, uh, these are air air source heat pumps that are 100% electrical for um, the cath, and there are limitations to these systems as we we talked about it uh, previously with uh, uh, Paul, I mean. Um, uh, Broad Meadow and Elliot. So you, there are limitations depending on the, how hot that day is and humid and how or how cold that winter is and the wind blowing. So right. um, there 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 are some times when it's really difficult to keep these spaces as cool as we would like to keep them or as warm as we would like to keep them, especially in the the colder winter months. So they they're super really the uh, hot humid days. Um, and this is some right. sometimes it's not just the fact that these doors are being used; it's that these systems are limited in their ability uh, more so than these other uh, electrical compressed systems with um, um, you know, a, a gas fired furnaces. So these are the things that we need to consider when we move forward into the future with these newer uh, air source heat pump type systems. Excellent. Okay, can you just put the uh, slide back up for next steps, Kamea? I don't know if that's easy or not. Just want to make sure as we close this down, we're just all good with the uh, next steps, which, yeah. So meet with the seniors, reach out MBTA. What's the, what's the timeline of these? Um, are we thinking about getting to a output from these meetings? Um, either halfway through this or all the way at the end of it in a month's time? Is it two months time? Where, where are we sort of in the timeline of this? So I think our draft report to you is due in March. And if there's no additional comments or different directions, um, options to explore, I think all of the options presented tonight could be priced out. Um, and I think that's the key information in making any decision. I think um, the other next steps, if you will, um, reviewing office space with LaTanya, um, analyzing the program data, I think those would probably take about two weeks. So I think we could have a lot of this um, information for you in about a month's time. Okay, so do we think it's reasonable then, uh, Hank, in, in sort of December? time meeting to come back to this? Uh, yeah, that would give you uh, the full month of November, oh. Rachel. Um, there's only one meeting in December, which would be the 12th. I think, yeah, the 12th of December. <clears throat> now that'll be a probably a pretty busy meeting because it'll be uh, both studies and um, construction projects. Um, but uh, Rachel, we can work with you and um, if you get a, uh, a draft report completed, mm -hmm. uh, we could share that well in advance of that meeting so members would have a chance to review it. And we we just touch on the high points and, and Q&A. Um, are, are there any other options that the anyone on the PBBC or Tim that, that you think needs to be explored? If if so, you 
we're getting late, so you can you can email them to me. Um, and uh, town manager was was a little busy working up the special town meeting. She hopes to get in touch with the MBTA within uh, during November. Um, I think they do have regular um, correspondence, but I'm not exactly sure of their timing. Um, and then Rachel, the other thing that you will be doing is looking with Tim at the space utilization, um, both now and what was uh, previously done, um, because uh, yeah. not all the rooms are occupied all the time. Yeah, that's the, the programming element I, I mentioned before. And so I will be meeting with the, the staff this week to look at their programming methodology and try uh, the first pass at understanding how those spaces are used. I think that that will be a process, a little back and forth that will take maybe a week and a half to, to really fully understand. And so in, in terms of our moving forward, I think um, PBBC should be thinking about which of these might be the highest priority projects if we couldn't do them all at once and um, what the effectiveness would be of creating a commercial kitchen or actually the necessity of creating a commercial kitchen for the senior center to continue its food um, remote meals program, which is now being cut off by the hospital, as I understand it, Tim. Yes, the traveling was program, yep. And that, that food component is a very important um, part of the senior center, both in terms of outreach and in terms of getting people into the building. Yes. And, and satisfying needs where they truly are needed. Yep. All right, Hank, is that, that looks like good. I think a great report, great options. And, and it does seem that there's more um, time that could be spent on the options. Um, and I think it's just a matter of making sure that those meetings, um, people can participate in that. And there is a working group. Uh, George, I see your hand up. Yeah, just a quick question. I, I know we've all kind of uh, dismissed the idea of using that space in the basement. And, and we, we've known from the beginning of the project that that space was going to be a difficult space to even use in the future because of the low ceiling heights. I, I guess while you're talking to various groups, um, I'd, I'd like to see people putting their their uh, creativity hats on and saying, if you had this space in the basement, is there anything you think would be a valuable thing to do for seniors that might be an additional um, uh, activity where we could use the basement space? I hate to see space go to waste. And even though that isn't prime space, uh, there's bound to be some kind of an activity that that space could be used for and and give us more space uh, than we currently have available to us. So I, I guess I'd like to see a little creativity on, on what the possibilities are um, of, of having something going on there. Just a thought, rather than dismiss it and say, oh, you know, we won't use it ever. Okay. I think that's a, it's a good point, George, and we do have to think and, and try to be creative. I think um, some of the seniors, especially the seniors who've been there longer, um, have some essentially PSD from from having been at uh, Stephen Palmer and sort of the basement set up there. Um, so I think that, you know, when you say basement to them, there's a, a knee jerk reaction of, oh, no, no, no. But I think it's absolutely critical. We try to think about what, you know, maybe it's some type of service we don't have right now. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a dark room for photography or, you know, there's ways we could Something. be creative where not having windows wouldn't necessarily be a drawback for some types of activities. Right. And, and you know, I, I know it's expensive to put a couple of, uh, uh, put restrooms down there, but we could put a restroom, you know, that was uh, 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 available at some point. It would add cost, of course, but that would be a necessity. So anyway, just a, 
just a crazy idea. You know, we're not gonna be able to add much space to this building and we're not gonna build a new senior center that's bigger and better uh, for a long time. So um, we ought to be as creative as we can with the space we've got available to us. I have to walk through it again with you. Okay. All right. Um, if that's it, that's great. Um, very good presentation, as I said before, and thank you very much for the uh, for the time. Um, we've run over, but I think it was well worth it. Um, I would just ask if there's any other questions, direct them to Hank, and and uh, we'll look for December somewhere in that vicinity, and and uh, see if we can pull these pieces together for the next review. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, that's the end of our major project topics. Um, thanks to the user group. Thanks to the professionals on this last one. Um, is there anything from a committee member perspective that we need to cover um, before the close of this meeting? Um, I, I don't think so. We, we, our next uh, study that we need to get rolling <laughs> This is the library space utilization study, followed by the DPW study. Okay. And um, I think they'd be in that sequence. The library is currently going through a um, uh, strategic plan. Um, so if we initiate the RFQ process for the library in, uh, in November, with the goal of having a, a firm on board by January. I think that would work well with their process. And the DPW study would um, go out to RFQ in the new year. Okay. And I think we should take uh, Hank in the next meeting and just come back to the uh, master planning sheet with all the different projects and the timeline and just review that. Um, I, I did update that. Um, but I'll, rather than going through it in detail tonight, I'll- Yeah, no, no, I don't wanna go through it. I don't, I, I don't wanna do that tonight. I'll I, forward I it on to you all. I think we can do it next meeting. We can just review the timeline, see where, where it all is. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll also determine whether we actually need the meeting um, at that time, based on, on where the, the bigger projects are right now. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um, open it up. Just last to any committee members, any last minute commentary questions before we close out the meeting? Uh, Hank, can you just stay on for one second after the after uh, the, uh, people get off? I know you want to get home, but it, it'll take like one minute. OK. Right. OK. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, close the meeting and uh, wish everybody a happy week. And we'll all see everybody in the next meeting. Thanks not going to say go Patriots. Well, <laughs> that was last night. Yeah. I know. I, yeah. I was going to say gone Patriots. Well, yeah. the question, George, is you can Should stop the recording now, uh, Hank, but I would just say, George, is it Mac or is it Happy Zappy? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question of the week. So who's going to start next weekend? Oh, man. It's got <laughs> to be Mac. Oh, I think we need Zappy. I think Mac is too, too shy. I think we got to go all out Zappy and have fun. Anyway, have a all good right. night, guys. Everybody, take care. Thank yeah. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Where's my leave? Thanks, Rachel. Hey, Hank. Yeah. Um, I sent you an email earlier. Um, I don't, I don't trust Socotech. They're not very responsive. They haven't been very competent in a lot of the things that they've been delivering to me. And I'm pointing out a lot of errors and flaws in their renditions and their submittals. And I shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, you know, their last project is putting that door in the front. So um, do we, I, I would rather just hand off that study for the operation cost for Tim to BH plus A if you know if they can give us a quick like amount and, and do a quick change order is that appropriate um so we, i mean it's it, it's so long as it's not too you know too much over the uh 
original estimate for the for the for the what they're doing now the study just adding that and putting in like a change order like uh is that something we can push through and so we can get it done sooner than later are are you you're trying to get that you you do the install so bh plus i mean uh socotech did the retrofit for the equipment and they never picked up the scope which was i i don't know if i missed it or whoever missed it. i missed it i'll take the blame for it but they never had the operating cost for what tim wants to do food wise and so now they're just getting back to me with a subcontractor that they could use and i sent you that email and everything that they do takes weeks and months to just move to the next step and then i have to i have to tell them no that's not what i asked for or you know this is this isn't you know the way we want to go kind of thing it seems like vh plus a is on the ball they know what they're doing they clearly have the resources and the 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 bench strength um so i was asking you i mean that this is this is your article um so do we want to just give them this additional service for in and have them just kind of give us a, an estimate and see if we can't push it through to get it approved so we can get this tied up um with along with the cat study um so the the door is the one to the I, I'm sorry, I didn't. So the main vestibule door, I'm changing out the door and the frame. Okay. So Socotech also was, I don't know how they got, they got the kitchen study. So apparently the scope was missing for the actual cost to operate what Tim wants to do. It, it isn't about the new equipment and the square footage. You know, Tim is really looking for how much is this going to cost me per year to make to make 160 meals a week or whatever it is he wants. So Socotech didn't pick that up and I missed it. So now Socotech is just coming back to me saying, yeah, we can get a hold of this con this subcontractor that does these types of studies, but they have not been very good at doing anything for me lately since uh, Steve Watchhorn left um, and they changed ownership. So what I'm saying is we're not committed to Socotech for this study for the kitchen operation study the cost of how to you know what it's going to cost to make these yeah. meals can we give this to bh plus a a matter of fact i believe rachel made a comment that she could do that and she offered that yeah i i think that's fine i just we would just need to coordinate with you um we need to do a pss i have to look at how much funding we have left i think i kept back Let's ask, let's just ask Rachel how much it would cost and take it from yeah. there. At least extend it to her and say, what is it going to cost to get an estimate for what Tim wants to do food service wise? How much is this going to cost per meal? Or, you know, I I'm, and Tim can we have the what Tim laid out as far as I need to know what the cost is. I think he said per meal, or um, but I can dig through that. But um, you know, she offered, she said we can pick that up. And I'm I either way, it's gonna cost one of us a little bit more money because it wasn't in their scope. So they're going to give me a change order or we give it to Rachel and they get a change order, which may be similar in cost, but I cl clearly BH plus A is going to provide something quicker and probably yeah. more accurate than what I'm getting from the people that I'm working with at Socotech. Yeah. And, and the other thing she did say was that she would um, share it with their um, kitchen designer just to see yes. if he has any critique. Yeah, yeah that, that certainly, yes, we can certainly extend the contract. Um, if you could email me the scope yeah, okay. um, for what you're looking at. And, um, and then, uh, uh, then I can forward that on to them. Okay, I'll them, give you the scope. Ask them the question. We'll right, start get, there. Yep. And then um, we'll, we'll probably need well, we need to set up a couple other meetings. One of them. No, I know. We do. Uh, one of them is with uh, GGD. And I, I do want to get um, Ed Quinlan to participate in that uh, discussion. For what? And so I'm looking at maybe next Wednesday or Thursday. For the calf? Why is GGD no, involved no. in the calf? Uh, GGD, I'm sorry, I'm jumping. Actually, we need to set up meetings for both of the projects. Both. Nick, the Nick you have suffered from ADHD like me. Just we're two peas in a pod here. 
jumping back forth. So absolutely, we need to sit down. I, I insist that we sit down with GGD and uh, Ed Quinlan. Absolutely, we need to go through that. Um, their uh, all the you know what they've what their their study their what they have so far for a study um, with Ed in the room. Absolutely. Okay. So um, we have a meeting tomorrow at one coordination meeting between your department and ours. Think about it. Look at your calendar, and let's let's discuss that at that time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. I your your screen is blurred, but it looks like you're still in the office. Just I, I am. So I'm gonna head home. I'm not gonna say anything. All right. Last last night was midnight. So I, yeah, yeah. You burn it. You take a day off on Friday. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? All right, Perry. See All right, you tomorrow. Yep. Bye.